Welcome, I'm Eric Wright, and this video is the first in a series of tutorials on LaTeX and scientific writing. In this video, we'll address the installation of a LaTeX distribution, a LaTeX editor, and then we'll spend some time working on how to format a basic LaTeX document. However, before we get into that, we'll look at some of the history of how LaTeX came about. In 1978, Donald Knuth introduced his initial version of the tech typesetting system. Tech's a markup language for formatting documents, especially scientific and mathematical and technical documents. Later, in 1984, Leslie Lampert augmented tech with a series of macros designed to make tech somewhat easier to learn and use for a broader field of users. The set of macros became known as LaTeX. As markup languages, tech and LaTeX are very different from commonly used word processing software packages. Tech and LaTeX use plain text with special control syntax that serves as instructions for formatting documents. This may be a little bit harder to learn, but they tend to be far more flexible and predictable for scientific publication. LaTeX is free and open source software. There are several good distributions available for download, and they will run on all major operating systems. In order to get started using LaTeX, first select, download, and install a LaTeX distribution. My preferred LaTeX distribution is TechLive, and it's the distribution I recommend you use. You can obtain it at the Tech User Group website, www.tug.org, in the TechLive directory. This is, this is what that website will look like. And depending on the operating system you plan to install LaTeX on, you'll access different areas of this site. So if you're installing on, on Windows, I would click on the installation and release notes for Windows. If you are installing on a, on, on a Macintosh, I would go to the link for the MacTech distribution. And then there are quick install and uh, instructions for Unix and Linux operating systems. Um, and those are, those are going to be the simplest places to start. This is going to be your first task in getting started with, with LaTeX, though. You'll need to install, well, download and install the TechLive distribution. And you need to be forewarned that it's a pretty large file that you're going to be downloading. So it'll take some time. It's often a good idea to set up the download overnight. Make sure that your computer is not going to go into sleep or a power management mode that will shut down the internet connection. Um, and just be, be prepared for it to take some time. But you've got to let the download complete, and then you've got to do the installation before you move on to any of the other steps for setting up um, a, a LaTeX installation on your own computer. There are alternatives to Tech Live, although I don't really use them any anymore. MicTech is one of the more popular ones that's out there, and I have used it in the past. It also runs on all major operating systems, so you can get it to install on Windows, Mac OS, and many Linux distributions. And you can find it over at mictech.org. Um, my recommendation still is that you use the Tech Live distribution. A third option that's worth considering under some circumstances is that there are cloud-based installations of LaTeX that, that do exist. They tend to be a little bit more limited, but they can be very valuable tools to have when you're traveling or having to work on some public terminal like a library computer. A pretty popular example of a cloud-based installation of LaTeX is uh, at overleaf.com. Once you've completely installed your LaTeX distribution, what that will provide you with is all of the binaries that you need for converting your text-based LaTeX markup documents into a formatted human-readable document. But it doesn't usually provide you with all that much in the way of tools for actually creating your LaTeX documents. For this, you're going to need a decent LaTeX editor. So after you've su successfully installed your LaTeX distribution, your next step is going to be to select, 
download and install an editor. My preference for the purpose of these tutorials is TechMaker, although there are many other good alternatives that are out there. TechMaker is free and open source software as well. It runs on Windows, Mac OS, and Linux, and you can obtain it at um, the x1math.net slash TechMaker site. Go to that site. It should look something like this, and this is a much simpler install process, a download and install process. All you need to do is click on the download link and it will start a installer that um, actually it gives you a um, gives you options for, for the operating system that you're going to run it on. So as you can see, there's options for Linux, Mac OS, and Windows. And just choose the one that's the most appropriate for your, your installation needs. It, um, it's a pretty quick download and it's a pretty quick install. Just make sure that you've already installed your LaTeX distribution before you try to install the editor. Because if you don't, the editor won't be able to find those LaTeX binaries that are designed to convert your, your markup documents into the human readable formatted documents. If you try TechMaker and don't like it, not a big deal. There's many other options. Some are commercial and some are free. You just have to search the web until you find an editor that you like. But you do need a, a decent editor that's well suited to working with LaTeX documents. So find one that you think you're going to like and stick with it and learn, learn it for a while. And it's really going to be all you need. So we're going to move on to writing our first LaTeX document. It's going to be a pretty simple one. It's not going to have a lot of content in it, but it's going to have all of the basic structure that you need to create and format your document. Now, every LaTeX document should begin with a document class command. It's going to typically be the first line in your document. The purpose is to declare the overall style of the document that you're creating. Um, these styles, there, there's many that you can choose from, articles, presentations, letters, posters, uh, theses for you know, undergraduate, masters, or doctoral level are all examples. And um, it also initiates the preamble of your document. The bulk of the document makes up another section of, uh, of, of the file, and it's called the body. The body of your document is contained between two commands, begin document and end document. So we'll go ahead and look at what this is going to look like when you're editing your own document in TechMaker. So this is what a typical, up to maybe some, some color and stylistic changes, this is what a typical TechMaker uh, installation is going to look like on your computer. On most of the left side here is where the actual markup document, the tech document is. And I've already done some editing in it. But if you were starting fresh, you wouldn't have a document on this screen. You'd want to go over to the file menu, tap select new, and this gives you an area that you can start typing. And so just to get a sense of, we'll, we'll move back to the document that I was working from in a minute, but just to get a sense of how this would work, you would just start typing those, those two basic pieces that must exist in any LaTeX document. You'll have your document class statement. And you'll notice that it begins with a, a slash. And then document class is an example of a command in LaTeX and all commands typically accept an input argument, and that's going to be contained in curly braces. And the input argument for document class is the name of the class that you're using to define your document's style. And for the time being, we're just going to use article. That's one of the common ones that's used for writing scientific articles. Once you've typed in that, that command, you can move down and set up the body of the document. And if you remember from our slide, that's done with the begin and end document command.
And these begin and end statements give us a, um, what we usually think of as an environment. So anything in between these begin and end statements are uh, the contents of the environment that we're working with. And right now we're working with the document environment. So this is, this is the body of the document. This is where we would type our text. It can be anything. This is some text is all I'm typing here. And so that, that would create the, um, you know, a, a very simple but a basic um, LaTeX document. Now I'm going to navigate over to the one that I had already had written in place uh, in, in a minute. But in order to be able to compile a document like this to make a machine or make a human readable document, one that's nicely formatted, you're going to have to do a couple of things. First is that you're going to want to save this file that you're working on on your computer in the appropriate format. You need to save it as a tech file. So we'll go file, save, and save it as, um, uh, I'll just call it temp.tech. And this is in the directory that I'm working in, but if you needed to create a working directory of your own, you would do so by navigating around in the, um, you know, the directory structure of your own computer. But I'm happy to keep it where it's at right now, and that, that's fine. So now it's saved as a tech file, and we can see that up here in the, um, in the, the file selecting uh, area. If I want to compile it, all I need to do is click on this Run button right here that's configured to, to run a LaTeX binary called PDF LaTeX. And so that's the binary that will take a, a, a markup file like this and convert it to a formatted readable PDF document. If yours isn't set up to use PDF LaTeX right now, then all you've got to do is click the down arrow and go through and select it. So click on it. And then I'd like to view it. Well, this should say view PDF, but if it doesn't, you'll want to go and hit the down arrow and select view PDF and then hit the run button. And what you should see over here in the output area, I'll blow it up a little bit so we can see it, is a document that just has that line of text that I wrote. This is some text. So nothing overly exciting, but it, you know, it, it's a human readable document. You can see that it's automatically had a page number generated as well. So I'm going to get rid of that document and I'm going to go to one of the ones that I was working on. And it's pretty much the same thing. It, it begins with the document class command and then um, the begin and end document environment. And then this text at the beginning, that's, these are examples of comments. You'll see that they begin with a percent sign. And you can use comments in your LaTeX document to just serve as notes to yourself for later on for what you were trying to accomplish in that part of the document. I had just used this comment as a header so that it's easy for me to look at the document while I'm in it and see which version it is that I'm working with. So this is the document that I'm using to build up our first LaTeX article. And we can see that if we compile this one, by clicking PDF LaTeX once and then view PDF, then the document in our preview area here, blow it up so it's a little bit more visible. Um, so this is your first document, so it matches the text that's in our file. In summary, that's what our basic document looks like. It begins with a document class statement, and then it contains a body afterwards that's wrapped by the begin document and end document statements. But there's much more that we can do. So we can add information into the preamble of our document right after the document class statement. And some of the things that we can do there is select different document classes. We can also establish what the title, the author, the date of publication are going to be for our document. These are all going to be commands that would appear in the preamble. And then later on, those parts of our document would be rendered using the make title command. And that would appear in the body of the article. We'll see.
Another thing that we can do in the preamble of our document before the body begins is that we can load packages that give us enhanced functionality in our document. They, they give us additional ways that we can format our document and make it look the way we want it to look. Finally, we can also configure some of the packages that we've loaded in the preamble as well. Here's an example of some of the, those things in action in the preamble. I've done a little bit more configuration in the document. I've adjusted the document class statement by feeding it a optional input argument. In LaTeX, commands are given optional input arguments through square brackets. And the argument that I've given it is 12 point, saying that I want my document now to have a 12 point font. There's a few comments that just explain um, what it is that I'm trying to accomplish in my document. And so the next few lines make up some of the front matter of the document. In other words, the title, the author, and, and the date. And so title of the document is going to be simple, just first document, the author is me. And to make sure that it's always updating to the current date as read by the computer clock, I'm just supplying it with the LaTeX constant today. And again, that has a backslash to the date command. Now we're going to load and configure a few packages. None of these are actually going to be packages that we'll use in this particular version of the document, but they are packages that contain functionality that I use so frequently. It's often a good practice for me just to use load these packages into the preamble, whether I'm going to use them or not. And so there's three from the American Mathematical Society. AMS Math, AMS Sim, and AMS Theorem, spelled a little bit differently. And those are just going to give us additional mathematical features that we can uh, use to format mathematics in our document. The Book Tabs package is one that will allow us to create enhanced tables for displaying data in a document. And we'll get into that much later in this series. And then finally, the GraphicX package allows us to import graphics from external files, like JPEG images or PDF images, um, things like that. Then finally, in the body of the document, I'm going to do a little bit more. I'll issue the make title command so that a, the title and my name and date will appear in the document. And then I'm going to put something that appears in the beginning of most uh, scientific articles, an abstract. And an abstract should just be a self-contained, almost like an advertisement for your article that makes a case for why um, your article should be interesting to your intended audience. And again, later on, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about and working on how to craft a decent abstract. So now if I compile this document and then view it, you can see that all of that structure has been formatted in automatically for us. So I'll make it a little bigger. What we can see is that you know, the title is there in a large font. My name is the author is a little bit smaller along with today's date. And uh, there's an abstract formatted in a small section called abstract and followed up afterward by the text, the only text that we've got so far in the body of the document. This is, this is your first document. So that's how the document starts to take some shape after you add some of these features through the, the preamble of the document. Notice we really didn't have to do that much in the body other than to issue the make title command and create the abstract. So to summarize some of that, um, we've added the front matter to our document. We've added the title, the author, the date. We've rendered that front matter into the document by issuing the make title command in the body of the article. We loaded a few packages that we haven't really used yet. We haven't really needed to configure any of those, but we'll see some examples of how that might happen in the preamble later on. And then we created a very short abstract. Well, there's more that you can do in the document. Once you start adding text to the body of the document, you're probably going to want to organize it with kind of a hierarchical structure. And so 
articles, scientific articles, like the one that we're working with here that, that's defined using the article class, allow you to organize your document with sections. And those are going to be created with a section command that would appear wherever you wanted your section to start in the body of the document. But those can have within them subsections, which are not surprisingly created with the subsection command. There are also sub subsections that can be created within a subsection. They're created with a sub subsection command. And that's it for the section hierarchy. But longer documents created by the book class, the thesis class, or similar classes also have chapters. And so while those won't fit or appear within an article document like the one that we're working with, they would appear in those, those larger documents and they'd be created with a chapter command. So here's a version of our document where we've just created a few sections without much content in them. So everything else that we've got so far, we've, we've retained it. But down after the abstract, I've created an introduction section. And the way that works is that I use the section command and the input argument that I feed to the section command through the curly braces is just the title of the section. It's introduction. You can see that I've got another few sections and subsections and sub subsections within them. And just so that we can see what that looks like, I'll compile it and view it. And now we can see that those sections are automatically added to our document. Notice that they're numbered. And that's going to be an important fact to remember as we're moving forward, is that we've already seen one example of this. We've got a page number that appeared in our document, and our section numbers appeared in our document as well. Those were automatically generated for us. These weren't, there was nothing that I did to label the introductory section as section one. So these are examples of things in LaTeX that have what's known as a counter. And we're going to see that we can take advantage of those uh, to, to really make our life easier when we're working with longer and more complex documents. Before we get into working with counters, though, added enough text to our document now that it's time to think about how LaTeX controls the placement of things like letters and words and sentences. LaTeX generally controls the geometric features of the document, such as spacing between words and lines and paragraphs. These are features set by the document class, and it's important to understand how LaTeX interprets white space. So you can put as much space between words as you want in your LaTeX document. However, LaTeX is going to ignore this, and it's going to compute an optimal word spacing according to rules set by your document class. A single return at the end of a line in your LaTeX document is going to be ignored as you're rendering your document. So a lot of times what I do is, is when I'm working in a text editor, I make sure I put a single return at the end of a line once I get up close to 80 columns, just as a convention to the 80th character in a, in a row, in other words. And LaTeX is going to ignore that. It's not going to put a line break in the formatted document. It's going to locate its line breaks optimally according to rules set by the document class, just like it does with spaces between words. However, a double hard return at the end of a line of text in our LaTeX document is going to create a line break in the rendered document, and it's going to indicate the start of a new paragraph. Now you can also explicitly indicate a hard return with the double slash symbol on a new line. And what that will do is it, it will also start a new line of text in the formatted document, but it's not going to indent it as a paragraph. In this document, we'll demonstrate the effects of white space within your tech document upon the formatted document. And so the first thing to remember is that LaTeX largely ignores spacing between words. It's going to, in the formatted document, calculate spacing according to rules that are set in the document class itself. So 
in this section here playing with word spacing. You can see between the words 10 and spaces, I've actually inserted 10 spaces. When we look at the formatted document in a minute, those 10 spaces are going to be ignored and it's going to just look like perfectly normal text on a page. You can force the issue with spacing to some extent. If you look into the LaTeX documentation, and we'll, I'll show you where you can gain access to some of that in a little while. If you look into the LaTeX documentation, you'll see that there are some commands that you can use in LaTeX to explicitly put in a certain amount of space. So slash comma gives you a little bit of space. Slash semicolon gives you a little bit more. Slash quad gives you more still. And slash q quad gives you even more than that. And so when we look at those lines of text, we'll see that the spacing between the words first and second in those different examples are going to be larger and larger and larger as we move from example to example to example. You don't generally want to do that unless you've got a good reason. Sometimes I use spacing like that when I'm formatting certain types of mathematical expressions, but I rarely do it in the text of the document itself. But those, those commands are there if you need them. You can also look at line spacing. And remember that we said that a single soft return at the end of a line, such as this one right here after the, the, the statement, a single soft return such as this one, it's going to be ignored. So there will not be a line break after the word the, or, or after the word one, and before the word will in the formatted document. However, if I do two returns right here after return such as this and before create a new paragraph, it will give me a new line and it's going to indent it. So that line creates a new paragraph should appear indented in our final formatted document. And then finally, the double slash will create a new line. So explicit will begin on a new line of its own and it won't be indented. So let's compile that and just verify that that behavior is what happened. So I've compiled it, I'm going to view it. Now we'll make some room so we can, there we go. So I see what it looks like. All right, so between 10 and spaces, we see there's just an ordinary space. There weren't the 10 spaces that I typed. Here's those examples of first and second where there was a comma, a semicolon. Let's see, where was it? This was an ordinary space yeah, between this first and second. This was a slash comma. This was a slash semicolon. This was a slash quad. This was a slash q quad. And we can see how those all compare to the natural spacing. Sometimes the difference is subtle, but it's there. And, you know, if you use quad and q-quad, it often is going to look odd in ordinary text. And that's why I recommend just really letting LaTeX do the word spacing the way it's, it's designed to. As far as line spacing goes, one place where there was a, um, a hard return, or, or soft return, rather, let's go back to the document and look at it, was right after a single soft return such as this one, right at the beginning of that section playing with line spacing. So let's go look at that. Playing with line spacing, a single soft return such as this one, and see, it doesn't return. It ignores that single soft return. So you can use those soft returns just to make your tech document more readable as you're editing it without having any influence over your formatted document. Now, where I got my hard return of the paragraph invent, indent was after return such as this and before creates. That was a double return that I typed in, and that's what gives me a new line with a paragraph indent. And then down here, another option is to use the slash slash explicit hard return. 
that gave me a hard return, but no paragraph indent. So those are the ways to play a little bit with line spacing. Now there are other ways. There's, there's things that you can do to your document to force it to have um, more spacing between lines uh, uniformly throughout the document. There's places to do it locally. And as we need those, we'll probably introduce them later on. But for the time being, as you're learning, it's best to really just let LaTeX manage word and line spacing according to the rules that are set within the document class and not worry about it too much yourself. We're finally ready to spend some time looking at how LaTeX manages these automatically numbered elements in our document. We've already encountered numbered elements in our, our documents, things like sections, subsections, sub sub subsections, chapters, even pages, they're automatically numbered. And as we gain familiarity with LaTeX, we're going to encounter many more document elements that are automatically numbered. It's possible to control how these elements are numbered to some degree. We're not gonna get into overriding the numbering right now, but it is possible to do it. What's more important is um, we can suppress the numbering if we want to. So some numbered elements can have their counters suppressed and this is done, generally speaking, with an asterisk notation. So if we use section asterisk instead of slash section, then that's going to give you a new section in your document, but it's not going to have a number on it. And the same falls for subsection and subsubsection. And we'll see that there are other analogous examples for other structural elements within a document. It's also possible, and this is really the big thing to keep in mind about numbered elements in a LaTeX document, it's also possible to assign a descriptive label to a numbered element and refer to that label with a reference elsewhere in your document. This is huge. What it does for you is that it relieves you of the responsibility of having to make sure all of your references to numbered elements and the numbered elements themselves are synchronized. If you had to do that by hand as you're editing and re-editing and revising a document, then it can really get overwhelming fast. And so it's possible within LaTeX to automate that process and cause it to keep track of that synchronization for you. So here we are in our document. There's a few things that have happened here. First of all, at the end, we can just see that I've included a few unnumbered sections and subsections. I've done that with the asterisk notation. We'll see that when we compile this document, those are just going to give us some new sections at the end with the same bold headings that we've seen for sections and subsections already, but they're not going to have a numerical label on them. So we'll look for that once we compile this. What's more important for us to really get straight here is the use of the label and the ref commands in LaTeX to attach a label to a numbered element and then later to refer to it in the document. So I here I'm attaching a descriptive label to the introduction section. And right after I've initiated that section, I use the slash label command, and then I give it a label of my choosing. So I'm going to suggest that you don't use numerical labels, use descriptive ones. And then I follow a naming convention in my own documents. So for sections and subsections and those sort of organizational structural elements like those, I use S colon at the beginning of my descriptive label. And then I give it a word or two for whatever section or subsection it is that I'm referring to. So the label for my introduction section is S colon introduction. It could be anything, but you want it to be something that you're going to remember and something that's going to be meaningfully connected to the numbered element, in this case, the introduction section that you're trying to attach a label to. You'll see that I've done this on other elements as well. 
I've added a S word space label to the section I'm playing with word spacing, uh, an S line space label in the section uh, for playing with line spacing, and so on. Now, somewhere in this document down here under a new section that I've called labels and references, I've referred to those earlier sections using the reference command. So right here we can see where I'm typing section slash ref s introduction is our introduction. What's happening here is that the ref command looks for a label within the document that has this name s introduction. Goes back to the to the um, element that has that label attached to it, finds its current value in the counter that's attached to that section. So what it's going to look up the section number, basically. And this, in our formatted document, slash ref s introduction, is going to be replaced with that numerical value. In our case, it should be 1. Section 1 is our introduction. We'll see that I've, I've done this with the other sections that I've labeled as well. I've referred to section ref s word space and section ref s line space. And those are going to be replaced with numbers in the formatted document. So let's see that. Let's compile our document and then run it. And I look. Something disappointing happens. Right. All those places where I said numerical labels are going to appear, we don't get them. We get double question marks. Well, what's happened is that once you start introducing labels and references in your document, you need to compile your document twice in order to get the labels and references synchronized. So you need to get into the habit of running PDF LaTeX twice before viewing it. And then when you view it, those section and subsection numbers get updated. So we have section 1 as our introduction. Section 2.1 addresses word spacing, or should have said subsection 2.1 addresses word spacing, and section 3 addresses line spacing. The last thing to notice here is our unnumbered sections. These were the sections that we created using the slash section asterisks and slash subsection asterisks commands. And all that the asterisk does is it suppresses the counter, it turns it off for those sections, and they just don't get numerical labels. You know, sometimes there's good reasons to do that. Um, I don't do it that much, but it's an option that's there if you need it. That brings us to the end of our first LaTeX tutorial. So if you practice the document writing skills in this tutorial, you ought to get to the point where you can write and structure a pretty simple LaTeX document. It's not going to have a lot of features in it, but it, it's going to be one that will have a title, your name as an author, a date, an abstract, some sections, and some text included in those sections. You should try to play around with labels and references so that you can refer to the sections and subsections and other numbered elements by their, their um, correct synchronized numerical label rather than one that you try to hard code. The reason why that's so important, this is probably the most important and most advanced thing about this this tutorial is that you need to imagine what would happen if right now you started hard coding section one and section two in that part of the document where we were referring to those sections by by their labels let's go back to the document and see that so if instead of typing section slash ref s introduction here, I just typed section one. The reason why that's a bad idea is that what if a week later I come back, got a new idea that causes me to insert a new section right before the introduction? Who knows what it would be about, but you know, maybe I'd, I'd have to do that, a new section before the introduction. 
Well, LaTeX is going to update the counter of that section so that it becomes section one and introduction becomes section two. But if I've hard-coded section one instead of using a reference down here, then I need to go down and find where I did that and manually change it to section two or whatever the current correct numerical uh, counter on, on the introductory section is. And, you know, that might not be that big of a deal, but what if I've done this 50 times and then I keep editing and revising my document and it causes all of those numerical labels to shift around and get updated again? Um, it can get overwhelming pretty quickly. But if I make use of labels and references whenever I want to refer to those labeled items, then those things never change. I mean, the underlying numerical values do, but LaTeX will keep track of that for you, and you don't have to manually go through your document and update them yourselves. So once you've you know, finished drafting your first basic introductory LaTeX document, make sure that you're experimenting with the label and ref system as well so that you can get the hang of using it. If you make sense of it early on and you're uh, learning process for working with LaTeX, then it's going to save you a lot of headaches in the long run. That brings us to the end of our, our tutorial. And in future tutorials, we'll look at things like working with mathematical notation, including graphics into a document, or including tables, or working with bibliographies, and many other topics as well. So I hope you'll Come back for the future videos and we'll keep learning LaTeX together.